particular trust bridges presented by Contech Engineered Solutions and U.S. Bridge. Before we start today's presentation, we would like to cover a few housekeeping matters that will ensure we have a smooth presentation. We have placed all phones on mute to cut down on background noise and to ensure everyone can hear the presentation. At the conclusion of today's webinar, we will provide information on how to obtain PDH certificates for today's presentation. The webinar is scheduled to last for one hour. We will have about 50 minutes of presentation followed by a question and answer period. When you logged on to the webinar, the GoToWebinar window will have appeared in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. This window will minimize by itself after a few seconds so that it does not interfere with you viewing the webinar. If you would like to maximize this window, just click on the small red arrow and the window will be maximized. The blue box in the GoToWebinar window will allow you to minimize or maximize the presentation so you can view it in whatever size works best for you. If you have a question, please type your question into the question box. We will be taking them throughout the webinar. Presenting today will be Troy Oblinger from Contact and Dennis Ganano from U.S. Bridge. Troy is the Vice President and General Manager of Stru Stru Trust Structures for Contact Engineered Solutions. Troy has more than 18 years of experience with Contact in operational, manufacturing, supply chain, and commercial roles. Dennis is the Director of Engineering for U.S. Bridge. He has over 27 years experience as a practicing engineer and engineering manager. He is a graduate of Michigan Tech and a registered professional engineer in the states of Ohio, Iowa, and Michigan. Our guest speaker will be Petrina Butler, project manager for TRC Companies Incorporated. She has more than 12 years of experience focused on bridge and roadway design in South Carolina, Florida, West Virginia, Mississippi, and Connecticut. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Petrina. Thank you, Lisa. Today I'm going to discuss U.S. Bridges Railroad Grade Separation Case Study, which is published on their website. If you go to U.S. Bridge under Research and, Research and Tools and Case Studies, uh, you could download the case study right there off the Internet. The specific project we're going to talk about was a bridge replacement over CSX Railroad for Spartanburg County Public Works and that is located in the upstate of South Carolina. This case study will begin with an overview of the project and presentation of several bridge types that are feasible options for the replacement structure. It will then discuss the decision-making criteria that was used to determine the most suitable structure type for this railroad grade separation project. So first off, what's the purpose of preparing a structure type study? First, we want to set the goals and criteria of the project. We want to present feasible alternatives, make comparisons, and describe the differences and document the selected alternatives. Our first basis for comparison will be the initial project construction cost. This will be looking at the roadway pay items, clearing and grubbing, earthwork, pavement, erosion control. We'll look at bridge pay items, which will be the foundation work, the superstructure, including barriers, uh, right-of-way acquisition costs. For a railroad grade separation project, we'll also have costs associated with the railroad flagmen and engineering fees. Now, a major contributing factor for the initial project, project cost is the depth of the superstructure. Now, this is measured from the top of the deck to the bottom of the lowest bridge member. This affects the profile grade. We need to maintain a minimum vertical clearance over the railroad, and overall, this will impact the construction limits. We'll also look at life cycle costs. This will include the initial cost to construct, annual work activities, maintenance and inspections, repair and preservation work every 10 years, minor rehab, so this would be a deck including deck resurfacing and sealing, major rehab, which will be a complete girder and deck rehabilitation or replacement, residual values, and net present value. Now, we'll not get into the details of the cost estimates during this webinar, but you can review them in detail on the complete case study on U.S. Bridges' website. Another basis for comparison will be constructability and permitting. That will be the type of equipment required, the access to the site and delivery of materials, staging areas, crane pads and causeways, and environmental permits. As far as crane size and position, we could look at staging at the lower level, so this would be adjacent to the railroad tracks, or at the upper level where we're staging on the approach roadway. 
And permitting for this project will include permitting with the railroad and also permitting, environmental permitting and inspection. Now we'll get into the details of the case study. The existing bridge was a three-span wooden superstructure that was approximately 15 feet wide and 85 feet long. The structure was 70 years old at the time of its replacement with one of the lowest structural ratings in the county. The vertical clearance between the top of the railroad track and the lowest bridge member was about 21 feet. Beyond the existing abutments, the ground surface slopes steeply downward to the railroad bed below. There's an embankment slope of less than one and a half to one. The ADT was, 12, was 1,300 vehicles per day, which is high for a county road, but it can only accommodate one lane of traffic. This shows the, uh, an aerial of the existing bridge. Uh, it ran perpendicular to the railroad tracks below with blind curves leading to the bridge and a posted speed limit of 50 miles per hour. There have been numerous serious vehicle accidents on the approach roadway and the bridge. For the new roadway alignment, it was important to eliminate the blind curves by straightening the alignment with large radius curves that were designed for 30 miles per hour. The goals and criteria for this project is first of all to improve safety. Public safety is an important criteria for any project. Due to the change in roadway alignment, the new bridge will need to be skewed about 30 degrees. It will be wide into two lanes with wide shoulders. And another important factor for this project is worker safety during construction and in the area of the railroad tracks. Construction methodology and the ability to limit construction work within the railroad red zone is a critical component of this project. We'll also look at increasing capacity. This project will increase the vehicle capacity of the structure by widening from one lane to two lanes. And I'll also increase the loading capacity of the bridge to meet the current standards of the AASHTO LRFD code. I'll also look at minimizing interference with the railroad. The proposed vertical alignment must provide a minimum of 23 feet vertical clearance from the railroad top of track to the lowest member of the bridge. Now, since the existing vertical clearance to the shallow wood beam structure was only 21 feet, we anticipate a significant grade increase to maintain the minimum required clearance. Also, the construction method and staging process can produce a large impact on the project in regard to keeping clear of the railroad corridor or the railroad red zone. I also want to minimize construction limits. That will be minimizing additional permanent right-of-way obtain and environmental impacts. And one of the main factors that will affect the construction limit for this project is the bridge structure depth and the rise in profile elevation to obtain the minimum required clearance over the railroad track. We'll also consider the economic impacts, both the initial construction cost and the life cycle cost over a 75-year time period. The span arrangement for this project relies on the criteria for overhead bridges by CSX. And just reading through, through this real quick, it shows that the standard horizontal clearance from the center line of the track to the face of the pier abutment is typically 25 feet or greater, but never less than 18 feet and provisions for future tracks, access roads, and drainage may require that this minimum clearance is increased. And the toe of the footing should not be closer than 11 feet from the center line of the track to provide adequate, adequate room for sheeting. So some early feasibility decisions to consider is whether there will be one track or two tracks, along with one span and three span bridge options, and also the crane location and lifting method. So if we look at a plan and elevation of the bridge site, you know, you could see um, with the future track, if there was a future track, would it be on the west side or the east side of the bridge? And also as far as staging, as shown in blue here, would the staging, would the staging occur on the approach roadway? Or would the cranes be adjacent to the roadway shown in, um, shown in or adjacent to the railroad shown in red? Uh, where we would need to cut into these steep slopes to build an access road. And just to review the different lifting methods, whether we're tra on the track side or on the approach roadway, for track side, um, there would, again, we'd have to cut in a haul road down the side slopes, and there's limited storage area at that track level. But with an approach roadway, we don't need a haul road, and the staging is simpler. 
for crane size and crane pads, we can use lighter cranes on the track side um, since we're since we're closer to the pickups and we have steeper uh, a steeper pickup angle. Versus at the approach roadway, we'd have to use heavier cranes and possibly larger pads as well. For railroad impacts, track side, there's more force to count work and flagman costs, and there's slower progress and diminished safety. Whereas on the approach roadway, it's faster progress and we're out of the railroad red zone a lot quicker. So the total bridge length is controlled by the minimum distance required to realign the roadway with the bridge skew of 30 degrees and tied to the existing slopes and by the required span ratios for a multi-span bridge. If provisions for double tracking are considered in design, then sheeting, soil nailing, or a tieback type system can be used to stabilize the slopes with any future modifications and grading in the railroad right-of-way. For a single track, the total bridge length of a multi-span bridge is similar to the length of a single span bridge. So the multi-span span structure, such as a precast concrete deck, is generally a cost-effective solution with a shallow structure depth. For double tracks, the multi-span bridge is longer than a single span option, and the span length required over the tracks will require a structure depth that's comparable to a single span. It is desirable to minimize the total bridge length and therefore lessen the impacts of right-of-way obtains, driveway tie-ins, grading, etc. Also, the impacts of constructing intermediate piers within the railroad right-of-way include the additional cost of pier construction and a longer construction schedule. Therefore, the single span option was a chosen alternative for this case study, which can allow for future expansion of the railroad. For a single span bridge of this length, possible structure types include a pre-stressed concrete girder bridge, a welded steel plate girder bridge, and a steel truss bridge. In this case, it was a prefabricated truss bridge. Preliminary engineering for each bridge type was based on the AASHTO LRFD bridge design specs and the SCDOT bridge design manual. The beginning and end of construction remain the same for each option, and then based on the estimated structure depth for each bridge type, a profile was developed to maintain the minimum vertical clearance over the railroad track. Then cross sections were prepared to determine the earthwork quantities and construction limits. So if we look first at the pre-stressed concrete girder option, we would have four type 4 ashto girders spaced at 8 feet. Each girder weighs over 90,000 pounds. There would be cast-in-place concrete barriers. And if we just take a closer look here to look at, there is a normal cross slope on the bridge. There would be an 8 and a quarter inch concrete deck composite with the girders, and a quarter, a quarter inch of that is considered sacrificial. The total structure depth is almost 69 inches. The existing profile would have to be raised, therefore, by about 6 and a half feet. For the welded steel plate girder option, we'd have four variable depth plate girders spaced at 8 feet. Each girder weighs almost 28,000 pounds. It also has cast-in-place concrete barriers. It would have a normal cross slope as well with an 8 and a quarter inch concrete deck composite with the girders. The total structure depth is over 55 inches, which means the existing profile will be raised by almost 5 feet. This is the section showing the prefabricated truss bridge. It's a half-through configuration where the trusses are cross-braced cross below and above the traffic. Each truss girder weighs 35,000 pounds. And here the guardrail is connected to the truss. And note for this project, protective fencing for the railroad was not required. If it was, it could be incorporated into the truss design. And for the case of the ashto girders or the steel plate girders, it would be anchored to the top of the concrete barrier. Again, we have a normal cross slope, an eight and a quarter inch concrete deck on stay in place forms. The total structure depth is almost 43 inches, so the existing profile would be raised by 3.6 feet. Now, if we just take a look at reviewing the results, uh, the detailed cost estimates, design drawings, and right away exhibits are again published online in the complete case study. Uh, this summarizes the initial project costs. For alternatives one and two, it's at over $1 million, which is 30% higher than the, than the prefabricated truss bridge option. And that's a savings of $240,000. The life cycle costs are still at about 30% higher than the prefabricated bridge, and that's a 75-year life cycle. 
the disturbed area is less than one acre for, for the prefabricated truss bridge, where it's over one acre for the other alternative. And this plays a role in the environmental permitting and construction inspections that would be required. Uh, the right-of-way obtained is also the lease for the prefabricated truss bridge. And the profile grade was raised the most by the pre-stressed concrete girders at 6.5 feet, 5 feet for the steel plate girders, and 3.6 feet for the prefabricated truss bridge, you know, which is a, a difference of almost 3 feet. The foundation type is, is all pretty similar. Here in the upstate of South Carolina, we typically use HP steel piles with concrete pile caps. Uh, the pile cap is a little bit deeper and longer for the pre-stressed concrete girder. <coughs> the uh, prefabricated truss bridge does use, um, does use eight lighter piles uh, compared with the, other, with the other alternatives. And also for the pre-stressed concrete girder option, uh, because of that, that large increase in profile grade, we would have to construct retaining walls as well. Uh, for environmental impact, again, the prefabricated truss bridge has a land disturbance of less than one acre, so we don't have the stormwater pollution prevention plans required for the disturbance over an acre, which requires additional permitting and construction inspections. Comparing the construction methods, both the pre-stressed concrete girders and the steel plate girders have um, are long beams that are difficult to transport versus the prefabricated truss is transported in, in several sections and it's bolted on site. Uh, construction method, the pre-stressed concrete girders require heavy cranes, while the other alternatives use uh, medium-sized cranes. Uh, the difference here is that the prefabricated truss bridge is, um, is staged on the approach roadway versus the other two alternatives are anticipated to be staged along the track level, which would um, require additional construction time in the railroad red zone. So that's, that's a big difference in the construction schedule. Um, and there's also additional time for grading and construction of retaining walls for the pre-stressed concrete girders. So the conclusions from the case study were that a single span alternative was a prudent way to minimize the construction cost while providing for future expansions of, future expansion of the railroad in the future to either the west or the east side of the current track. The, the steel uh, prefabricated truss had the least impacts to project footprint in terms of raising the profile grade, the disturbed area, and the right-of-way acquisition. And the prefabricated truss bridge was also the least costly alternative, you know, saving, saving $241,000. So what have we learned? We've learned that comprehensive costs are important to evaluate. We need to consider not only the initial cost to construct, but maintenance, repair, and rehabilitation over the life of the bridge. That changes in the profile grade can have a significant impact on the overall project cost. This means additional right-of-way, project footprint, additional grading. That costs embedded in pay items, such as mobilization or permitting, can also have a significant impact on the overall project cost. And as was shown in the case study, prefabricated truss bridges can provide an economic solution for railroad grade separation projects while also reducing the construction time in the railroad red zone. And I'll leave it off here with a picture of the preferred alternative. Uh, the construction was completed in 2011. Thanks, Petrina. That was an excellent presentation. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, Petrina gave us a few examples, um, but we'd like to get your opinion and launch a poll question. What driver is the most influential in choosing your vehicular bridge solution? Life cycle cost, speed of installation, environmental and permitting, or aesthetics? Please go ahead and log your votes now. I apologize to anyone on a mobile device. Um, the surveys do not work as of yet. So they're working on that, but I apologize to anyone on a mobile device. Also, as we are going through the presentation, don't forget to log your questions. We're going to take some time at the end to get to a few of them and answer some of the most asked questions. If we don't get to yours, we'll try to get someone to answer them in the near future. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give you a few more seconds on the poll to make sure everyone has a chance to vote. All right, I think we're good.
64% of the audience has chosen life cycle cost, 20% have chosen speed of installation, 13% environmental and permitting, and 3% aesthetics. Thank you very much for your participation, and I'd like to turn the presentation back over to Dennis of U.S. Bridge. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Petrina. I appreciate the time you put into to putting your presentation together for us, and um, and uh, we're very, very glad that you helped participate as our guest speaker today. Uh, before I get into the, the, the meat of the presentation, uh, in my section, I wanted to make sure everybody understands or knows who U.S. Bridge is. Um, we uh, we're located in uh, Cambridge, Ohio, and I like to say that we are today's bridge company, doing uh, what bridge companies did over a hundred years ago, uh, before Ashto was formed. Happy birthday to Ashto, by the way! It's the hundred hundred year anniversary of Ashto, um, and also before all the state DOTs were uh, formed. Or, or at least almost all of them. Um, we're designing and fabricating steel bridges all over the country on a large scale. Um, following, though, what's different today is we're following, of course, uh, modern uh, uh, bridge design codes and criteria and uh, any state and local guidance that's uh, given to us through the scope of services that we're working on. And we're, we're constructing and uh, building those bridges according you know, to today's uh, methods and, and standards. Um, the way we participate in a project is usually uh, we're part of the we're part of a general contractor's team to construct a bridge in in, in a, a deferred superstructure design uh, submittal package. So uh, we work ahead of the uh, letting of the project with consulting engineers or owner agencies to um, build the project in a preliminary engineering fashion, developing with them schematics and schemes, model specs, et cetera. Uh, and, but we're not actually get to go ahead until we're uh, teamed with a, a general contractor with our pricing to, to go forward with them and design the bridge um, as the engineer record for the superstructure uh, until, until that happens during the project phase. Uh, we are an AISC certified uh, fabricator been in business for over 75 years. Um, we specialize in cons uh, custom specified prefabricated steel bridges and that means we're designing unique solutions for every bridge site that we're scoped to work on. Um, we uh, have decades of experience developing private and public projects, bridge projects, and uh, that includes federally funded jobs through your local agencies and through some of the states that we work with directly. Um, to briefly explain what the advantage is to using a steel truss bridge, uh, I mentioned here on the left the through girder system. And if you look back at this uh, opening picture, you can see uh, the large truss girders on the outside of the roadway, and that's that's a through girder system. And uh, with the framing that goes on beneath the roadway, the transverse span is much shorter than the, of course, the long, longer uh, longitudinal span, so you know, a 140-foot bridge is designed with a superstructure member that's only uh, spanning tr uh, transversely, maybe 28, 30, 32 feet. So, of course, the 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 size of that superstructure from from that aspect is much shallower than what's needed to go all all 140 feet, let's say. So, what that does, like Petrina's. Um, presentation talked about it reduces the site impacts, uh, it creates more opening for uh, hydraulic conveyance or more vertical clearance over the railroad or, or, or highway lanes or whatnot. So in that aspect, when, when project footprints are tight and clearances are, are tight, we get considered and, and that's really our bread and butter. And uh, the other important part of that and also very much to what um, Petrina's talk uh, spoke to was the the lighter uh, the lighter steel members for their length allow us to ship them in smaller pieces, build them on site, uh, pick them with lighter cranes, 
uh, it, it reduces the trucking permits as well, and so therefore uh, there's an advantage sometimes depending on the site in that area as well. And then for the 3% of the folks that like aesthetics from our poll, I'm just kidding, but we, we also see that a lot of times our, our, our bridge types are, are scoped or specified because of they are an attractive uh, addition to the infrastructure for um, a public agency. They have a lot of uh, good, obvious form and function. Their structures, uh, their structures are uh, obvious and inspectable, and there's nothing embedded. And so that is also sometimes a uh, an enhancement to to scoping a job like that. Bottom line is we can provide shallow and attractive clear spans. That's what is the takeaway here. Now, real quick, uh, again, we're going to um, use a learning tool just simply, which is a, a set of project profiles, sort of as an idea book. All, all, all good engineers keep a good idea book going, and so what I'd like to do is add to that today with our project profiles and some of the key features that I'll highlight during the talk. We're not going to go into detail about how to scope or design a steel truss bridge per se, but we are going to go through a couple of unique details and areas, and they're going to kind of hit on these bullet points here and there, both in the transverse or longitudinal direction. So please pay attention, I guess, to the cover picture and sort of all that's going on there, and then also all the details off to the side. There'll be some dimensions, there'll be some attributes uh, mentioned that should be worth uh, looking at and considering, and then when we get to the second slide of each uh, project, we'll um, highlight something that was important in that job that I wanted to share with you. The key aesthetic attributes here, we have just simply a lot of uh, things that go into what makes the bridge look the way it does on at the site that it does, the span and depth, uh, sizing, the uh, height above the, the channel or low point, um, panels, number of panels, if they're uh, tight and condensed or uh, spread out, number of verticals, etc. how the top cord is shaped, whether it's polygonal or bent like a camelback or whether it's um, arched like an uh, uh, arced cord, top cord. Uh, we have um, bridges here we're going to show that have ornamental fixtures and railing that enhance what it looks like in a you know, small but additive way. Some of them even have light standards and, and um, fixtures attached. And of course, how that bridge is um, protected against the environment factors into its appearance as well, whether it's uh, weathering steel brown or, uh, as we see here, a few painted bridges, the yellow bridge uh, in a military park in Georgia, the red bridge there in uh, King County, Washington, and the black uh, arch top uh, bowstring there in, um, in uh, Massachusetts. Uh, the other ones uh, uh, have feature uh, weathering steel or um, or galvanizing, but all that factors into what the bridge looks like. So let's get started with the project profiles. Um, here's a, a rural bridge in Ashtabula County, Ohio. It's a three-span bridge. And uh, a couple of unique things that um, are worthy of mentioning. It was uh, the substructures and foundations were designed by the, uh, the county engineer's office. So they were um, put out. We work with them to put the whole package out for bid and then we're successful in, in part, uh, participating with a general contractor to work on it. The, the uh, central span there that you see is a 172-foot pony truss span. It's a pretty large pony truss with that, with that uh, two-lane width. And um, a couple of the unique features about it is the, are the wooden uh, glue lamb um, uh, deck panels that were used. Uh, they were topped with an asphalt topping and uh, we also uh, notice that there's a continuous uh, railing system. We can see that in our uh, photo here that's built off of some support members on the approach beams and then continues on uh, across the truss here. So it's a fairly straightforward uh, rural bridge type, um, but one that was worth sharing. Another one here is uh, similarly Adams County, Ohio. Is a uh, a deep through truss. It's got uh, overhead bracing uh, because of the height of the truss girders. It's spanning 200 feet, so 
that's a good size for um, for any bridge, a single span bridge. But for um, for a pony truss, that's pushed in the limit. So we we want to build a a through truss with bracing at this stage, um, most likely. Um, the unique feature about this bridge, besides um, how uh, how it goes together, is really what what's unique about it. The the uh, intent to stay out of the stream to avoid permitting with coffer dams and any kind of shoring was mitigated by leaving the existing superstructure in place, an old narrow through truss, and from that bridge crews were able to support the field segments, get them bolted up together, get them braced by needling beams and uh, braces uh, through the old bridge, and then once stable uh, used it to deconstruct the interior of the the old bridge inside the new one. So we end up with a wider but similar clear span. And so um, that's certainly worth uh, considering on a project with that kind of challenging uh, environmental conditions. Uh, here we have the Riverwalk Bridge to uh, the Island Entertainment Complex in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Now as the as the title of the bridge or the name of the bridge infers, there's a lot of pedestrian way uh, access that gets people from the parking area on one side to the entertainment complex where the picture was taken. Um, in fact, that's a very, very large sidewalk. I think it's a 10-foot inboard sidewalk on the inside of the bridge and a 6-foot uh, sidewalk cantilevered on the outside. So lots of pedestrian way access. Uh, that is featured here. This is a 165-foot uh, bolted pony truss with weathering steel, and um, it was a very low water crossing. So we had uh, work with the uh, design engineer that did the substructures and the, and the roadway um, design. I think it was Vision Engineering down in Tennessee to get this project put together. And, and the the key feature I want to convey here is this is a this is a bridge model that is from that that project and the bridge models that we do here we use to design and detail the bridge from beginning to end so that we have a we capture all of the elements that go into it. we virtually build it in the computer which is important uh, it saves time it increases our quality it helps us program our machines and it talks to our inventory system so on a on a large project like this it helps us keep track of all the pieces and all the bolts and all the things we want to ship together and um, and it keeps track of all that so that we can we can um, get that bill of material as, as accurate as possible. Now it seems like a whole lot of items and assemblies but we build lots of those pieces here and then ship them. Um, even the shippable assemblies are, are, are a lot of little pieces that actually get categorized as shippable like uh, some separate washers that were used here and there and in, in the numbers of hundreds that uh, that go there. But anyway, that's really what I want uh, folks to see and, and I also want them to, to know there's some other images throughout this presentation we used straight from our models. Um, this bridge is in Washington County, New York and um, it has a unique feature I wanted to share which is, is all happening on the edge of the edge of the bridge, the edge detail for that slab is a uh, is a curb section. It doesn't look like it. it. looks like it's over the side drainage, but really there's a stainless steel plate curb that's mounted to the slab with a with a neoprene gasket. And also um, there is a, a four two braille that's a New York standard and it provides a, 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 a crash tested standard, or excuse me, a crash tested uh, open rail, uh, post and beam rail system which is also one of the things we want to make sure um, our audience knows. I mean, really, that was kind of how I approached this presentation, is I wanted to answer questions that were related to what's possible and uh, what are people and, and, and other engineers doing uh, on projects with us. Um, so that's why we shared this project. Here, this one answers simply a question, you know, um, can we put safety-shaped concrete barriers on these bridges? Of course we can. And this um, is an example of that. It's, uh, it's a 34-foot wide roadway, and so that might have factored into the engineer's scope of 
why they wanted safety shape barriers, but um, in essence, that's that's the reason for sharing. This is again also a great site to share or show, which is is a very low water crossing in in Sussex County, New Jersey. This is a very typical kind of project for us um, in New Jersey, and. Uh, Here's a detail that's uh, part of that as well, which had to do with continuity of stringer beams. Um, the owner wanted to scope that, and this is how we comply with it. We put a strap member across the floor beam and bridge those two stringers together so that they are uh, not considered simple. Um, when coupled with a panel spacing of less than 14 feet, it's our belief that uh, the owners um, can consider that floor beam non fracture critical and um, in this particular case that that bridge used 15 foot 3 inch panels so that is uh, in there in an inspector's mind still a fracture critical floor beam but uh, again if the panels had been less than 14 feet that's where we would be with uh, with those kinds of um, uh, excuse me those kinds of details in inspection um, requirements for F, FC members. Um, I don't know if everybody can see that, so I'll take that off. Um, here, this bridge in uh, Greene County, New York, it's a very good uh, clear span example. This bridge spans a flood, uh, flood waters which are about one foot lower than the, uh, the low steel elevation and um, the, flood, the flood waters can come screaming down this, uh, this stream, Skohari Creek in upstate New York. Um, this this bridge has several features to share and take a take note of. One of which is the precast uh, panels used to form the deck slab. They were um, installed with uh, shear studs into grout pockets and uh, post tensioned, and then grouted in place. So uh, the contractor post tensioned these panels and then post tensioned them to. Uh, approach slab panels, which basically created a jointless bridge. You can see that detail here on the lower right. Uh, the approach slab is here, deck slab is here, and there's a post-tensioning duct that connects the two. And then that was overlaid with asphalt uh, to form the uh, final wearing course. Additionally, we had a very shallow superstructure, excuse me, a, a abutment seat to uh, contend with based on the, uh, the reconditioning of the uh, uh, abutment seats and, and expansion of the abutment seats and so what we have there is a, what we call a recessed truss bearing shoe which is the load plate is higher than the, the bottom cord member. Uh, here we have a participant poll. Lisa, you you got this one? I'm ready. Thanks, okay. Dennis. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to know what is the biggest benefit you see in utilizing a vehicular truss bridge? Speed of assembly, ease of design, proven solution with experience, minimizes disruption to the general public. Again, we are still taking some questions. Um, please don't, uh, please go ahead and don't hesitate to ask us anything you'd like to know about the um, vehicular trust bridges. We'd be happy to answer at the end. If we do not have enough time to answer at the end, we will have someone follow up with you regarding your specific question. So don't worry about that. We will get them answered. I will give, leave the poll open for a few more seconds to make sure everyone has time to vote. I see them coming in, so a couple more seconds to make sure we got everybody. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Okay, we have 45% say speed of assembly, 22% say minimizes disruption to the general public, 18 on a proven solution, and 16% on ease of design. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'll turn the presentation back over to Dennis. Okay. We're going to try and pick up some time here, but uh, I think some of this is pretty valuable stuff, so I'll do my best to throw it at you. Here we have a project in, uh, in New York again with, uh, with a, uh, a roadway over the CSX Railroad. And so the challenging part of this bridge uh, was mainly focused on reusing those existing abutments here again. They were, um, they were reconditioned, strengthened, and capped uh, to provide a new, a new bearing 
points for uh, a replacement um, truss bridge. The, um, the bridge here has a very steep slope and also you can tell it's an extremely um, large skew angle to the uh, railroad below. In fact, uh, it was a 61 degree skew, so that's also what's possible with, with steel truss bridges. Additionally, we worked with the design consultant and the contractor to come up with a lightweight uh, floor system. We settled on an exodermic deck slab, which is a, uh, a structural system that uses um, uh, structural tees with holes drilled in the web that's engaged to the concrete and also has a form system and a single layer reinforcing. It's a thin superstructure element. This was only four and a half excuse me, I think four and a quarter inches of concrete and then the tees below that and sets into the framing of, of, the, of the steel uh, bridge. It allowed us to uh, supply reactions that were light enough that, that um, permitted the reuse of those abutments. Additionally, it had an, a very steep grade at the end of the bridge as it dropped into the, the town and, and met an intersection. And so that 9% exit grade there uh, was accommodated by some unique framing at the end of the bridge with an end, end floor beam that had a bend angle in it so that it was a level for about half of it and then broke down the slope to the far uh, truss shoe. Uh, additionally, uh, we had a cantilever sidewalk with band of protective fencing mounted to it and it supported some utility. So one of the more complicated types of bridge projects that we've had in recent years. Here's a signature bridge in the city of Temecula, California. It's the same one that kicked off um, my portion of the presentation, although we're looking at it in the opposite direction. We have weathering steel truss girders at 150 foot span and some very large cantilevered sidewalks, nine foot nine on each side. We've got some, uh, some uh, stained and patterned concrete uh, uh, deck wearing surface here as well and, and some aesthetic enhancements like light fixtures and, and entrance pylons. One thing to mention about this bridge that the contractor took advantage of was the shore construction here down in the right hand corner. Those blue shoring towers were erected in the, in the stream channel because it was dry for most of the year. It's a, uh, only wet for a few months of the year and so that allowed the contractor to use lighter crane equipment and build the bridge across using those towers. Additionally, one of the other things that's a what's possible question is the arrow there is pointing to web penetrations that permit uh, you know, basically an interior water line location that is running uh, within the framing of the, of the superstructure. Contrasting that to a bridge in uh, downtown Pawtucket, Rhode Island, this bridge was closed for many, many years in the city of Pawtucket uh, until they finally uh, conceived of a solution that involved a, a, a truss bridge. Uh, here we have a Viking uh, steel truss bridge from U.S. Bridge. It's a curved top cord with Pratt web members and uh, it also uses uh, uh, traffic railing to separate the pedestrians from the, the roadway traffic. It has vandal protective fencing and um, in the next slide you'll see it's carrying some heavy utility uh, connections for the city, a 16 inch water line insulated here on the bottom right and then I believe there's a gas line to be installed there as well on that side and then on the, on the other side you can see a bank of electrical conduits along with um, stay in place, uh, corrugated stay in place uh, concrete form work that will support the reinforcing uh, layers and as well as the wet weight of concrete. Here we have a bridge in New Hampshire. It's got a profile grade. You can see we've uh, constructed the framing to form that uh, profile vertical curve uh, as long as well as the unique aspect that you can notice there's no joint in the pavement here at the end because this was an integral abutment, the first one we've ever done. We've done a few since then. We have encased the end stringers into a pour down diaphragm uh, of concrete. The bearings of the truss bridge girders, the truss girders are free to rotate 
and translate at the outside edges of the, this encased diaphragm. So we basically have a frame for the stringers and the truss functions as normal on the outside. On, uh, on this bridge in Virginia, this was designed by the Virginia DOT Culpeper District. It exemplifies uh, a full width bridge pick which uh, picks up on that high strength, low weight ratio for uh, steel. In addition to that, the feature that I want to highlight is what's called an extended slab that VDOT uses. It pushes the joint of the end of the bridge to behind the back wall so drainage is, is if there is drainage, it's seepage and it's dropping down to the abutment drainage system. It's worth uh, a note. And then lastly, a bridge in, uh, excuse me, this isn't lastly, um, this bridge in West Virginia uh, is uh, has a, has a detail that I wanted to share with everybody. It's called a, a drip gutter. It's installed underneath and beyond the, the armored strip seal that we see here. This bridge has corrugated floor and asphalt fill. It's, it's, there's a splash guard there on the left and the gutter here on the right as it slopes down. And the drainage would just keep, keep uh, diverted away from the diverted away from the bridge and keeps the bearings dry and and, and uh, free of debris. This bridge is uh, in Morse County, New Jersey. Again, we see a profile grade built into the framing of the superstructure. Uh, but the real reason I want to share it is it's a what I call a replica bridge using steel shapes built up into old style um, built up members. We have lacing bars, we have double angles, and we have counter rods that go through those double angles, and we have round headed tension control bolts that have the twist off spline uh, that are, you know, uh, non, they're not showing in these pictures, and basically it mimics a rivet construction. Below here we have a, uh, a similar bridge that we did for um, public meetings to show some alternates for a bridge in, in one of the western states that we're working in uh, where the consultant had a public meeting and the DOT and the consultant uh, have a historic bridge that they want to replicate and wanted to show the, the public what that looked like. And lastly here we have a, a faux truss example where these truss girders are on the outside of the superstructure. They're simply carrying their own weight and their brace to the superstructure behind them and uh, it was built with a continuous span beam superstructure, again with with fake girders on the outside. And with that, I'd like to hand it off to Lisa again. Thank you for your um, This is Troy Oblinger. Thank you, Dennis. Um, this is Troy Oblinger. We're gonna, in the interest of time, we're gonna skip the uh, the last poll question uh, to allow time at the end for some uh, questions that have come through during the webinar. I want to go ahead and thank Lisa for your coordination and as our moderator today, uh, Katrina Dennis, I want to thank you for your participation in today's Vehicular Trust Bridge webinar. Contact Engineered Solutions is a leading provider of site solutions for civil engineering industry. Contact portfolio includes bridges, drainage, erosion control, retaining wall, sanitary, stormwater, and wastewater treatment products. As Dennis pointed out at the beginning of the presentation, U.S. Bridge is a family-owned business since 1936. They are an AISC certified fabricator and specialize in custom specified prefabricated steel bridges. In 2010, Contec and U.S. Bridge entered into a strategic partnership. Combined, U.S. Bridge and Contec have the proven experience with more than 15,000 installations throughout the U.S. The benefits of the U.S. Bridge and Contec partnership include site-specific designs, where we can design in full compliance with ASHO, Caltrans, and other design codes. We have options to suit. You get the look and functionality that you need and want, the support with on-site installation assistance from experienced installers, experience, we have registered PEs in every state, and quality. We maintain the highest level of manufacturing certifications in the industry to make sure your job is done right the first time. In summary, our strategic partnership combines our organizations from a front-end promotional and marketing experience and resources, engineering acumen, that along with the manufacturing and quality expertise 
makes for a world-class synergy. Context DYOB is our exclusive online, online design tool to help you design your own bridge. The benefits of DYOB include drawings, which include head walls and wing walls, reducing the time needed to generate high quality drawings, and can generate detailed drawings to be included in proposals, design, and construction meetings. Just click on the link to your specific DYOB, enter the parameters of your bridge, and receive an isometric drawing of your contact bridge structure via email. Here you can see some examples of an isometric shop drawing. Additionally, within the email provided by the DYOB, you will receive contact information for your bridge consultant, a bridge brochure, and a sample of a trust specification sheet. On the U.S. Bridge website, there are additional online tools available for your use. One tool is the Structural Depth Calculator for both beam bridges and truss bridges. This tool includes the following four construction options. Concrete deck slab for composite and non-composite, steel plank asphalt fill, steel plank asphalt fill and waterproofing, gang nailed timber plank, and open steel grid. It uses the preliminary sizing matrices, so is consistent with the assumptions defined there. Another tool is the span style and width matrix. This chart defines practical span limits for a given width depending on the style and the shipping considerations. Please note that longer spans may be possible, but will require consultation with an engineer. One more tool is the preliminary composite and non-composite floor beam size matrices. The chart allows the user to select a preliminary floor beam size based on the span and width. Using the assumptions that are stated, you can determine a shallow or light floor beam size to assist in developing a proposed structured depth. On a collaboration perspective, we are here to work with you in, in early stages of a project to complete feasibility assessments for scoping advice, programming costs for funding applications, model specifications and schematic details, CAD line work for use in construction documents and preliminary engineering for modeling, and rendering on large profile projects for public meetings. Contact and U.S. Bridge have a national support network including front end consultative support from more than 30 bridge consultants, inside bridge consultants, national coverage for regional sales management, inside trust consultants, and project management to make every project successful. When your project bids, we provide to bidders hard bid quotes and information. Then, after the general contractor has won the project, we begin the next phases of engineering of record design and plan submittals. Our engineering has over 100 years of experience in the civil engineering industry and includes a team of dedicated product and application engineers providing support across all of our vehicular trust bridges. We are always working to find the right solution for your specific project. The Contact and U.S. Bridge team provide an end-to-end -end process, which includes construction assistance. We will share with you tips, tricks, and best practices to help make the erection go smoothly and the framing to fit up easily. These, these ideas begin as you unload the field segments and carry through to the last bolt being tightened. Scoping, estimating, preliminary engineering, renderings, bid packages, final engineering, fabrication, shipping, erection, and final construction assistance is what the Contech and U.S. Bridge team offers with more than 15 installations worth of experience. I want to thank everyone for their time today and remind you to please indicate in the survey at the conclusion if you'd like assistance on any upcoming projects or like a representative to meet with you or your team. Uh, we want to be a part of your next project. And with that, I'll hand it over to Lisa. Thanks, Troy. Ladies and gentlemen, there have been a few questions come up regarding the PDH certificates. At the close of the presentation, a new browser window should pop up on your screen with a survey about today's webinar. After you submit the survey, your responses will be made annually processed and you should receive a thank you for attending email within 24 hours. This will include a link to download your PDH credit and a copy of the slides. Again, this process is manual, so it will not be immediately after the presentation. If you have any other questions or if you, want, if you have not received your email within 24 hours, please contact info at contactes.com. Um, since we do have a few extra minutes, I'd like to go ahead and take some of the questions that came from the audience. Katrina, are you still there? Yes, I am, Lisa. 
Um, I have a question from, I think it was slide four of your presentation. Can you go over the difference between major and minor rehabilitation? I know you touched on it a little bit. Sure. The, um, I actually have a copy of the case study. Um, again, if uh, details of the case study can be downloaded from the U.S. Bridges website, go under usbridge.com, uh, research and tools tab, and under case studies. Um, so minor repairs would be uh, items such as resealing the deck, patching, overlay, minor repairs. Minor rehab would include, um, let's see, it has patching deck, overlay, minor repairs as well. Um, and major rehab would include a new superstructure. So that is the, um, for roadway erosion control measures and uh, it's portions of the structure the, the superstructure removed, the foundations uh, is assumed to have a life greater than 75 years, so that could stay in place. Thank you. And then there was another one, um, your span arrangement summary slide. Uh, can you explain span ratio? Uh, yes, yeah, so the span ratio, when you're, um, when you're looking at a multi-span bridge, um, the span ratio is, uh, say if you have three spans, um, it would be the ratio from uh, the first, say the first and the second spans. So you, you may not always have a, you know, 40 foot spans that could be longer in the center so that you could span over the railroad track or a river and the approach spans would be less. Great. Thank you. Um, Dennis, I do have a question for you. Uh, this one just came in. What is the lifespan on, of the weathering steel? Um, well, let's see, the, the, the short answer would be uh, as long as the bridge is intended to be there with proper maintenance and, and uh, attention to, to that kind of longevity activities, the, maybe that wasn't so short, but the, the longer answer is that it's very important to site a weathering steel bridge in a proper um, in a proper way, and, and FHWA and I think the steel industry recommend that weathering steel bridges um, avoid very, very low water clearances. I believe that the uh, height above still water is, is somewhere between six and eight feet. Uh, it needs to be greater than that to be conducive to airflow underneath the bridge so that the, the, the weathering steel uh, dries out and forms its patina protective oxide coating and and remains there so if that's the if it's sited properly and and it's not in a it's not consistently in a wet environment uh, that the weathering steel should last as long as the design life of the bridge which in, in our world is 75 years great thanks and then I have something to go along with that one uh, what type of warranty is provided on your galvanized trust bridges Sure. The, uh, our galvanizer that we have teamed with offers the 35-year warranty. We, we process it as, as part of our paperwork. It's uh, 35 years, covers, I believe, a 5% um, deterioration as defined by the, the warranty contract, and it covers all primary, mem primary members of the truss girders and floor framing, what's, uh, with the exception of any kind of galvanized floor planking that is a is a product that we also sell at, at, in, for some bridges and so that would be excluded an excluded item in that warranty. Great, thank you. Um, and I have had a few more questions come in regarding a copy of the slides. They will be available in PDF form in the email containing the link to your PDH certificate. Uh, we are hitting the top of the hour, so I'd like to thank you for your time and hope you learned something from our webinar today. Uh, again, that email should arrive within the next 24 hours. It will not be immediate. It is a manual process. So please email your questions to info at contactes.com if you need anything else, and have a great rest of your day.